In this video, we're going to cover Nintendo DS emulation on the PC version of RetroArch. Ah, the Nintendo DS, what a fascinating handheld from Nintendo. Two screens, compatible with new games and the Game Boy Advance library at first until the DSi came out and ruined everything. But emulation for this system has come a long way in the last few years and you can enjoy an overwhelming majority of its games through emulation. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how to get that set up on RetroArch, the PC version to be specific. Now this process has become a lot more straightforward over the last few months. So it should be a pretty simple system to dive into, but let's go ahead and get started. So to get started with Nintendo DS emulation on the PC version of RetroArch, you need to install the PC version of RetroArch. So if you haven't done so already, I do have links in the description below to my RetroArch playlist, where you can then view guides on standalone setup or setting up the Steam version. Number of optional settings are set here as well that you'll probably be interested in if you haven't done it. But once you have RetroArch installed and set up, to get DS emulation up and running, we only need a few things. So first, there is the optional use of Nintendo DS BIOS files and firmware. These are not needed anymore. It is completely optional, but it does give you a more authentic experience and might help with a few outlying compatibility issues. But again, these are optional. But if you are curious on how to acquire the Nintendo DS BIOS files and firmware for emulation, I do have a guide on how to dump it from your actual Nintendo DS or DS Lite. So a link to this will be in the description below for anyone interested. Again, this is completely optional. Otherwise, you could just resort to Google, search them up that way. I really don't care. Just don't ask me for illegal download links because I'm not going to provide them. But for the millionth time, completely optional step. But once you have your Nintendo DS BIOS files, they need to be named BIOS7.bin, BIOS9.bin, and then the firmware file needs to be firmware.bin. And to add these to your RetroArch install, you just open up your RetroArch folder. So for my example, I have it on the desktop in a RetroArch folder. Navigate to the system folder, and then just drag them right on in. And they are ready to be used. Next, you are going to need to source Nintendo DS games. If you have a large physical collection of Nintendo DS games and want to dump your own games and save files, I do have a guide on the channel on how to do so, so I'll have a link to this in the description below. Does require a modded DSi or 3DS system to accomplish though. Or again, you can resort to Google to find Nintendo DS ROMs. I, again, not, I don't really care how you go about doing it, I'm just not going to provide illegal download links. But once you have your Nintendo DS games sourced, they should be in a .NDS extension or you could leave them zipped up to save on space. Either option works, so for my games I have them zipped up. So once you have your game sourced, you just need to put them anywhere on your hard drive. It doesn't matter where they go because you can navigate to them within RetroArch. So for my demonstration purposes here, I'm just going to add them to my games folder in my RetroArch demonstration folder. So bam, there we go, done. And with that, we are ready to download our Melon DS course. So we can actually begin playing these things. So go ahead and boot into RetroArch. Once RetroArch is loaded, head over to the online updater on the main menu, Core Downloader. And from here, you can press right arrow on your keyboard or right on a D-pad on a controller to scroll down to the Nintendo section. And we are going to be looking for Nintendo DS. And in today's tutorial, we are covering Melon DS. So press enter to get that core downloaded. And once it's downloaded, you can just back out to the main menu. And now that we have the core downloaded and optionally the BIOS file placed, we are ready to begin loading up Nintendo DS games. So one method of doing so is to head from the online updater up to load content. Navigate to the directory where you have your DS games stored. So I have them on the desktop in that RetroArch folder, games folder, and Nintendo DS games. And then I could just go ahead and choose a game and tell it to load the archive. And there we go, my Nintendo DS games have loaded right on up. I'm not personally a fan of that method, so what I like to do instead is use the RetroArch desktop menu to make a games playlist, so that way it'll appear over here on the left for easy access. So to access the desktop menu, you go to the main menu and then click on the show desktop menu button right here, or you could just press F5 on your keyboard to launch it. Once the desktop menu has loaded, you'll see the content browser here on the left. So just go ahead and right click in any open space here. Click on new playlist and type in Nintendo space dash space 
Nintendo DS. And now you'll get a new Nintendo DS playlist entry here on the left with a DS icon here as well. Very nice. But in this main area here, now right click, add folder, and navigate to where your games are stored. And tell it to select the folder. Now for the core, you're going to choose Melon DS, Database, Nintendo, Nintendo DS, and then press OK. And all of your games should now populate your playlist entry. Now another cool benefit of the desktop menu is it shows you if your BIOS files are being detected if you're choosing to use them. So if it shows up green, you know they are being detected properly. It's also important to note the DSi BIOS files if you plan to do DSi emulation. You can set Melon DS into a DSi mode to play DSi enhanced games. It's outside the scope of this video today, but the option exists for anyone interested. You just add these BIOS files to the RetroArch system folder, just like you did the standard DS files that I demonstrated. They just need to be named DSi, 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 DSi. yeah, all that stuff right there. But if you are interested in making your DS playlist look a little bit prettier, you can try to download thumbnails for the system. So you can just right click on your Nintendo DS playlist entry here, download all thumbnails, this playlist. And chances are, if your games aren't named correctly, it won't find anything just like it did for me because it expects games in your playlist to be named a specific way. Typically that is the game name followed by a region code. So. For example here, Final Fantasy 3 USA. So now if I tell it to download the thumbnail, nah, it still didn't like it. All right, cool. But even if you can't get this method to work, it is pretty simple to add in your own box arts. So what I like to do in these cases is go to Game Facts and look up the game in question. Then the media section here, boxes, and you'll be greeted by the entire box art history for the game. So I'm looking for the US release not this weird reprint one. I want the original. There we go. But just going to save the image of this to my desktop. So now back over on the desktop, there is that box art. Unfortunately, it is not usable in JPEG format, so I have to convert this over to PNG. So for Windows users, which this tutorial is for, just open up Paint, drag the box art in, and then just save it as a PNG format picture. You don't even need to change the name or anything. Just save it as PNG. So there we go. Now make sure you have the game you want to add the box art to selected. So Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow. And I'm just going to drag the PNG picture over to the box art area here on the bottom right. And it applies the box art to the game. So that way it pops up when I select it. So if you want to do this for all of your games, you can now do so. But for my demonstration purposes, we're going to call it there. So once you have the playlist finished, just go ahead and close out of the RetroArch desktop menu. Press F on your keyboard to make RetroArch full screen again. And now to get your new playlist to show up on the left, just click on Restart RetroArch in the main menu. And once RetroArch is rebooted, you'll be greeted by a Nintendo DS playlist entry here on the left, with all of your games showing up here, and then box art over on the right if you added it. And then to play a game, all you need to do is select it and tell it to run. And with that, you are now ready to begin experiencing an overwhelming majority of the Nintendo DS library. And if you have a controller hooked up, you can use that to play your games while the mouse will act as your touch screen. So as you can see on the bottom screen there, I'm moving my mouse around and it's got that little gray box showing where the cursor is. So you can just click on your mouse to activate the touch screen. Just give a quick demo of that real quick. So game start, select data, data one, type in a name. Yay. And there we go. And now I'm gonna switch over to my dual sense to actually play the game, so there we go. So as you can see, you get the full functionality of the DS system in both touchscreen and gamepad controls if you so desire. But this being emulation, there is just so much more we could do with Melon DS than just this. So from this point on in the video, we are going to be covering advanced core options available to us within Melon DS. So to access our core options, just press F1 on your keyboard or a guide button on a controller to access the RetroArch quick menu. Now navigate down to core options. And our first set of options are in the system tab. So first up, console mode. This is set to Nintendo DS by default. And that's what most of you will probably leave it on. 
So it is the Nintendo DS mode that no longer requires BIOS files to run. So if you aren't using any BIOS files, you will want to leave this on Nintendo DS. If you change this to Nintendo DSi mode, you need to provide Nintendo DSi BIOS files, otherwise you'll just be stuck at a white screen. Next up, boot game directly. So if you want the games just to start when you select them, leave this option on. If you want to be greeted by the Nintendo DS boot screen when you first turn on the system, you can turn it off. This does require Nintendo DS BIOS files and firmware. But just a quick demo of that one here. So we're going to close out of Castlevania. And I'm just going to tell it to run again. And there we go. There's the Nintendo DS menu. And from here you can use the entire DS menu like you would normally use. And you can set things like your nickname, birthday, color themes, like all the good stuff that you would normally see in the Nintendo DS boot menu. And then to launch a game, you can just select Castlevania. So that's a nice little authentic touch for anyone interested, but definitely not required. Next up, use firmware settings. So if you have placed a Nintendo DS firmware file in your system folder, you can turn this option on to directly read it. So that way all of the settings from your original DS console will apply to your emulated DS console. So for just a quick demonstration, since I loaded it up before actually turning that option on, it has overwritten my original firmware file to the one that has it named as Melon DS up there. So I'm just going to add back in my old firmware file real quick. So again, system folder, and I'm just going to tell it to replace it. And there we go. And now when I relaunch into the game, you can see that my firmware file has taken effect. The nickname up there is now Ice. It has my blue color theme and is just good to go. So if you want a most authentic Nintendo DS experience with the boot menu and your own firmware file, make sure that you have boot game directly turned off and use firmware settings on. But if you want to bypass the Nintendo DS menu because it can be quite tedious, you can always leave this option on, and then you can still have your firmware file being read directly within RetroArch by leaving this option on as well, so it applies to games. Next up, language. So this is where you'll just choose your system's language. Next, randomize MAC address. You could just leave this option off. And then the last option is to enable a DSi SD card. So if you have Nintendo DSi firmware, NAND, and an SD card bin file, you can enable this option to use the emulated SD card, but we're not covering DSi emulation specifically, so use that one according to what you are actually trying to do. All right, backing out, video tab. First option, threaded software renderer. If you don't plan on upscaling your games, turn this on. It could give you quite a good performance boost since Nintendo DS emulation is quite CPU intensive. But if you plan on upscaling your games, you're going to want to turn on the OpenGL hardware renderer. And turning this option on does require a content restart, so once you set it, just back out to your quick menu here, and then you can close the content. And since we're going to be covering upscaling, let's go ahead and choose a more appropriate game like Mario Kart DS. Alright, so here's Mario Kart DS at native resolution. Well, let's go back into those core options. Alright, so OpenGL internal resolution set to 1x by default. So you could just crank this option up and depending on the power of your GPU will determine how high you can crank it. It has um, some aspect ratio problems, Weaker cards can have trouble with some upscaling, so do be aware of that. If you get a huge amount of lag where you didn't used to have any, just turn it back down until you get better performance. But as for the broken aspect ratio, that can happen sometimes with integer scaling. So if you are cranking it up and the aspect ratio kind of flips out, you can disable integer scaling and it should fix it. Not always a guaranteed fix, but one worth trying. And of course, if you change any of your RetroArch uh, base settings while you're in a specific game or a core, you'll want to make sure to save the core overrides on that one so that way it doesn't affect all your other systems. So under the quick menu, you'll see an override tab. 
and then you can save those as a core override so that way they don't mess with your other systems. So for me, I really like having integer scale enabled, but it messes up DS emulation. So I'm gonna save a core override with integer scaling disabled just for DS games. But there we go, Nintendo DS emulation at much higher fidelity than it could ever have hoped to dream in its own lifetime. Now do be aware that upscaling can introduce some graphical artifacts to certain games. So like in Castlevania here, you can see that there's some odd lines going through the screen that aren't supposed to be there. So if you encounter issues like that, you could turn the internal resolution back down for those specific games and then save them as a game override so that way they aren't affecting your other games that you can upscale. Next up, we have OpenGL Improved Polygon Splitting, so you can turn this one on or off to see how it affects the look of your games. And then last in the tab, we have OpenGL Filtering, so this is set to nearest by default. Has a more DS look, but if you want to kind of blur the image a bit, you can apply a linear filter. And it just helps smooth things up a little bit, so you can see that the textures here on the road and Yoshi's car are just a little bit more blurry, less pixelated but not the biggest of difference on this game in particular, but can have more significant effect on some other games. All right, backing out of the video tab, next up we have audio. So first up is microphone input. So this is set to emulate a blowing noise for games that require it, or you could set it to just white noise. So two different options here to use for when you are playing games that require a microphone input. And for those of you curious about what button to press for microphone input, you could back out of the core options, go to controls, port one controls. And if you're using a controller, you'll see uh, the keys they're assigned to there on the right. Otherwise, you'll see the automatic assignments here on the left for the keyboard. But scrolling down here, you'll see that L2 is assigned to make microphone noise. So in games that require it, you just press L2 and it should activate. Some other neat functionality of this is that you can swap screens with R2 and then you can activate a closed lid prompt with L3, so that can be used in some games. Next up, audio bitrate. This is set to automatic by default, but if you want to have better sound, you can set it to 16-bit, or if you're on a slightly slower computer, you can leave it at 10-bit, or just leave it on auto. Next, audio interpolation. So you can change up the audio output by choosing a different... Uh, setting here for the interpolation. If you want it just to be standard, leave it off. So personal preference on this one, you go ahead and listen to it, see which one you like best. Next, screen. So touch mode, this is for your touch screen emulation. It's set to mouse by default. That's probably where you're gonna wanna leave it on PC for the most precise performance. But if desired, you can change this over to a, an actual physical touch screen if you happen to have one or a controller joystick if you have one hooked up. So if you're sitting back on a couch or something, you don't actually have a mouse on you, and you want to emulate it, you could just use the joystick option. It'll assign it to the right analog stick, and you can navigate the touch menu with that, and then you just click down on it to select things. But for PC, mouse is definitely the best option. Next, screen swap mode. So this will let you choose between toggle or hold. And this will let you swap the position of your screen. So just as a quick example, if I press R2 here, you'll see that the position of my top and bottom screen switch. Next up, screen layout. So there's a number of different options to choose from. So top, bottom, bottom, top, left, right, right, left, top only, bottom only. And then the hybrid screen options are probably my personal favorites. So I like to use hybrid top. And essentially this gives us a much larger top screen while the bottom screen is slightly smaller off to the side. So it makes better use of screen real estate and prioritizes the actual gameplay screen without losing any of the information that the second screen provided and I just really like it. And depending on what you need to do, you could just swap those screens. So there we go, now my bottom screen is the big one and my top screen is the small one. So for Castlevania being on the bottom screen, like I would just do that. So hybrid top is definitely my preferred option, but personal preference on this one. Next up, screen gap. So this will let you set the pixels apart that the screens are. I believe that the original DS Lite had a 64 pixel screen gap. I don't quite remember off the top of my head, but that will emulate the screen gap here so that way you can see cutscenes kind of more accurately with how they are supposed to be. Instead of them being smushed up together, they might not line up correctly but there's a number of different options to choose from here for you to decide on. 
but I don't typically use that one since I use my hybrid top screen layout. Next up, hybrid small screen mode. This only shows up if you have the hybrid option chosen. This is set to bottom by default and it keeps it there on the bottom right of your screen. If you choose the top mode, it'll appear up in the upper side of the screen. And then a fun little option is to actually choose duplicate and this will show both screens on the side while having your prominent screen be bigger. So will be more GPU and CPU intensive, I'm sure, but it's it's kind of kind of a nifty option, especially for cutscenes. But personal preference on if you want to use that option or not, otherwise you can just leave it on bottom. That way you just have a nice cleaner setup. And our last option in here is the hybrid ratio, and this only works with the OpenGL renderer. So basically you could choose to have the prominent screen much bigger compared to the smaller screen, just like this. Or you could just have it as a, a two to one. So if you want a bigger top screen or bigger game screen, set this to three. Moving on, CPU emulation settings. Not a lot in here you really should be messing with. You're gonna leave most of these options on. But the one option you might be curious about for certain games is the JIT block size. This is set to 32 by default and that should be fine for most use cases, but if you want to get a bit more accuracy out of this emulator, you can decrease the size. If you have a good emulation PC, you shouldn't have any trouble using this with um, lower block sizes, but again, you could just leave this at 32, be perfectly fine with just default emulation standard, but just something to mess with for those of you looking to tune your DS experience, I guess. But that's going to do it for our core settings. So as always, if you want to save certain settings for some games but not others, again, in case of that Castlevania example where you might want to have the internal resolution set lower, you can head up to Manage Core Options and save them as a Game Options file so that way those settings only apply to that specific title. Now one last thing I want to cover here real quick before we call this video is shaders. RetroArch has an extensive shader library that a lot of you might be interested in using. So heading into the shaders tab, you can enable the option here if it isn't already. And do make sure that you have downloaded shaders from RetroArch's online updater. But from here you can go in to load, load up the shader slang menu, and just begin applying any number of shaders to your heart's content. Shaders are a personal preference thing. So just choose one that you like and run with it. So for me on Nintendo DS, I like to go into handheld and apply a Nintendo DS uh, grid with motion blur. So here we go, LCD grid, color and motion blur settings. Just to give it a more authentic Nintendo DS look. So this does result in washing out the colors a bit more than probably a lot of people would like, but it, is more reminiscent of what the DS screen actually looked like and you get a nice LCD grid line and then of course the motion blur that goes along with it and if you're playing Pokemon games this definitely helps the look of those as well but once you find a shader that you like go back into the shader tab click on the save button and you can save them as a core preset so that way every time you load up a Nintendo DS game that is the shader that is going to greet you but that's going to do it as far as Nintendo DS emulation is concerned within the Melon DS core in RetroArch. Again, this video was more specifically tuned for Nintendo DS games. So for those of you looking to do Nintendo DS iWare and Nintendo DS i enhanced games, you will require those optional firmware files that weren't specifically covered in this video. But as always, thank you so much for watching today's tutorial. I hope it helps you get your Nintendo DS games up and running to your liking. But here at the end, I do have a couple of huge favors to ask. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to hit that like dislike button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial, as well as that sub button and notification bells so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. I always have loads of content coming your way and I'd love to have each and every one of you along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel and keep it going, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little really goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing all of this content directly to you. Big shout out to all of our current backers, y'all are amazing, thank you for being our champions and helping us keep this place going for as long as we have. But until next time my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.